Crimea, a peninsula which belongs to Ukraine but which has been controlled by Russia since 2014. It is an important place for both belligerents. Can Ukraine get it back? Could Russia accept the loss of Crimea? What significance does the Kremlin attach to it? Tadeusz Iwański, Iwona Wisniewska and Andrzej Wilk will provide an answer to those questions. Crimea fell under Russian rule at the end of the 18th century due to the wars which the Russian Empire was fighting with the Ottoman Empire. Since that time, Crimea has appeared in different emanations of the Russian state. There are short episodes, for example the Ukrainian Liberation War in the 1820s. There was an episode when Crimea, or a part of it, was under the control of the Ukrainian People's Republic. During the Second World War, Crimea was occupied by German forces, by the Wehrmacht. But in general, from that time, Crimea was Russian until it was passed to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic in 1954. So it was de facto still within the communist state, the Soviet Union, but its allocation was changed. There are different theories as to why Nikita Khrushchev decided to take this step. I am personally most convinced by the theory, the hypothesis that it stemmed from the anniversary issue. 1954 was also the 300th anniversary of the Pereyaslav Union when, according to Russian and later Soviet propaganda, Ukraine united with Russia. This fits in very well with the concept of Ruski Mir, etc. So, when Hetman Khmelnytsky transferred the Cossack state to the protection of the Russian Empire. There were class-related matters here because Khmelnytsky had waged a war against the Polish nobles, and there were matters related to religion, meaning, as a defender of the one true orthodox faith, he submitted himself to the protection of the Third Rome, which Moscow called itself then. And this is one of those theories, very sensible in my opinion. It was a large-scale propaganda event. The commemoration started at the beginning of 1954 and culminated in Khrushchev's gesture, meaning the transfer of Crimea to the Ukrainian Socialist Republic. Another theory points at the importance of Ukraine for Khrushchev himself. For years he was the first secretary of the Communist Party of Ukraine and later, support from the party apparatus there allowed him to attain the leadership of the USSR after Stalin's death. The 1950s also saw the beginning of the great communist construction projects, for example, the North Crimean Canal, which made it possible to bring water from the river Dnieper to the land in the northern part of the peninsula. <laughs> The Soviet Union was a very highly bureaucratized country. So making Crimea a part of that Soviet Socialist Republic meant it was possible to bypass certain bureaucratic impediments so that that process could move faster and more efficiently. I think that it was caused by all those issues, but I feel the ideological factor fits in very well, in particular because it is very well documented. If you read the propaganda from that time which accompanied these events, then this certainly comes to the forefront. The discussion over Crimea's affiliation began in 1991. The Russian-Ukrainian Friendship Treaty wasn't signed until 1997. One of the barriers to it was the Crimea issue and the Black Sea Fleet which is stationed there. There were also separatist movements in Crimea which Ukraine handled without bloodshed by granting the peninsula a degree of autonomy. It was a great success for the young Ukrainian state. In part, it took advantage of the fact that Russia was involved in the First Chechen War, and this backdrop meant it was possible for Crimea to become autonomous within Ukraine. But in reality, it wasn't a political autonomy. There were some elements of autonomy, but de facto, it was difficult to extend it to where it had real political decision-making power. For example, it was cancelled and, in fact, issues related to Crimea did not constitute a problem for Ukraine's territorial integrity in subsequent years. Ethnic Ukrainians are not in the majority on the peninsula. The issue continued to create difficulties. 
In fact, the Tatars were a pro-Ukrainian group who knew from experience what Soviet rule meant, who the Russians were. I'm referring here to the deportation in 1944, allegedly for collaboration with Hitler. The Ukrainians who were there were mentally and consciously speaking completely different Ukrainians than those from the continent or from Western Ukraine. Above all, they were very Sovietized, very Russified, indifferent in terms of the state and independence. This wasn't a major issue for them. We were all aware that if Russia wanted to interfere in Ukraine's internal affairs, then Crimea is a hotspot. It was a point which had all the conditions for it to succeed. We need to remember that there was a huge Russian military presence there. The Black Sea Fleet had of course been divided, but not evenly. The Russian side got much more. The expenditures were not on the same scale. They they were incomparable between the Ukrainians and the Russians. In 2014, Putin decided to take advantage of these conditions and to invade Crimea. I think the media was filled with pictures of the so-called little green men, meaning soldiers with no insignia who were silent and restrained. They surrounded the main buildings in Simferopol and other places, the airport, the council, the Crimean parliament. And it was a new technology. At that time, we were wondering what it was. Since then, Crimea has remained under Russian control, but its importance to Ukraine has not diminished. I have the impression that Ukraine approaches Crimea in two ways. Since the invasion of the 24th of February 2022, the significance of Crimea for Ukraine has been growing. It is partly visible in public opinion polls. When Ukrainians were asked immediately before the war how important Crimea is, around 60% said that everything should be done to regain Crimea. Now that's over 80%. So in fact, the issue of regaining Crimea, regaining the Donbass, regaining the constitutional borders is becoming more important. And in terms of mentality, I have the impression that Crimea, due to the loss, is becoming increasingly integrated into the Ukrainian consciousness about the state, independence and its territorial form. Before the war, Crimea wasn't a very important region, for example, in economic terms. It made up 3 to 5 percent of Ukraine's economic potential or represented that in GDP or GNP. But of course, it was a very important place symbolically. It was part of Ukraine. It was a beautiful tourist location to be proud of. All the brochures promoting Ukraine's tourist attractions had Crimea as an integral place. The Russian aggression in 2014 brought a crucial change. I have the impression that these issues of identity and mentality were not as important as they are now. Ukrainians went to Crimea, they knew that people speak Russian there, so they spoke Russian. It was treated as something normal and natural. Even if someone saw it as an issue, little could be done about it. In fact, it would be a big problem to Ukrainianize Crimea. They didn't want to antagonize the mainly Russian-speaking society of Crimea. In connection to that, I have the impression that the further Russia goes regarding Crimea, the stronger the opposite reaction is in Ukrainian society, and Crimea becomes more visible in Ukrainians' mental map. However, Crimea is also incredibly important for Russia. We need to remember that Putin to a large degree is building his political legacy on the 2014 Crimea is ours campaign. Crimea is symbolically essential for Russia. There's the baptism of Rus. Volodymyr the Great was first baptized in Khersonosus on the territory of Crimea and only later baptized Kyiv and the people there. There's the issue of large military campaigns, the Crimean War, the siege of Sevastopol during the Second World War. Sevastopol is a hero city in the Soviet and Russian nomenclature. For very many reasons, Crimea is a place Russians will not give up. I have the impression that it would be easier for them to give up the Donbass. The importance which Crimea has for Russia increased when Western sanctions were imposed in 2014. Te represje wobec głównych przedstawicieli rosyjskiej elity putinowskiej. These sanctions were leveled at the main members of the Putin elite in Russia, 
above all, Arkady Rotenberg and Yuri Kovalchuk, two of his closest friends, and above all, bankers, people who directly compile assets. And we can presume that some of those assets belong directly to Putin. Both the Kremlin and Putin used Crimea, the peninsula which Russia seized, to compensate the people who'd lost out due to the sanctions related to the annexation. The Crimea is our slogan was incredibly popular in Russian society and helped Putin boost his support, and the Putin elite took that slogan to heart. In fact, we can say that the businesses and Ukrainian property nationalized by Russia were in large part subsequently privatized, and Kovalchuk and Rottenberg were the beneficiaries of this privatization. In addition to that, Kovalchuk, besides the sanatoriums and resorts, acquired further vineyards, which we can say are world famous. They are certainly well known in the former Soviet Union. For example, Masandra, one of the main vineyards. Kovalchuk acquired it and its wine collection for almost nothing. The collection is one of the largest in the world and is over 100 years old. The compensation for the oligarchs is, however, only one element of Putin's Crimea policy. A policy directed towards Russian society and also towards the West was another element. It stated that Crimea was becoming a genuine part of Russia. In connection with that were all the infrastructure projects which enabled Crimea to join Russia. The construction of the bridge to Crimea, electricity supplies, meaning the construction of an electricity bridge, and the construction of electric power plants in Crimea, powered by gas directly supplied by Russia. A gas pipeline needed to be constructed for that. All these elements were either implemented from the budgets of state-owned Russian corporations or directly by the Russian budget. And the beneficiaries of these public procurements were again people linked to President Putin. Rottenberg built the Crimean bridge at a cost of $4 billion, and this was an additional element in the enrichment of the people close to Putin. Crimea also gave the richest Russians the opportunity to use their luxury yachts when the Mediterranean ports were becoming less accessible to them due to the sanctions. In connection with all this, all those oligarchs invested in villas in Crimea with access to the sea. They de facto significantly reduced the coastline accessible to local residents. It was an absolute privatization of the Crimean Peninsula. The cost of joining Crimea to Russia was estimated at 900 billion rubles, which was then around 12 billion dollars. This was also the money spent on infrastructure projects, as well as direct subsidies for the budget of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol, these two separate entities. This resulted in Crimea being one of the most subsidized regions from the Russian budget. Subsidies and transfers from the federal budget made up around 78% of the budget revenue of the Crimean Peninsula. So it was de facto directly financed by the remaining Russian citizens and their taxes. However, this did not have a large effect on the societal level, because this region and the average standard of living there was significantly below the Russian average. Pensions, of course, went up in comparison to the level when Crimea was Ukrainian. However, prices also went up significantly, especially because up until the construction of the Crimean bridge, de facto everything had to be supplied to Crimea by sea, which drove up costs, both energy costs and those of other goods. The water deficit also became a huge problem for residents. This, above all, had an impact on agriculture. Being cut off from the canal and the water supply from the Dnipro River meant that these shortages were serious and some villages and towns had a limited water supply. These problems got worse in the summer. But this did not prevent the Russian elite from fully providing water to their villas on the southern coast. Nor their vineyards. There were absolutely no problems with water at all. These problems have returned due to the destruction of the Novokhovka Dam, but there are more consequences of the Russian invasion for the peninsula. One direct consequence of Russia's invasion of Ukraine was the fall in popularity of the Crimean Peninsula as a tourist destination for Russians. Primarily because of military activity, the Russian government closed 11 airports in the south of Russia. Now only Sochi has a functioning airport. However, planes from Moscow to Sochi fly over the territory of Kazakhstan. 
This extends the flights and makes them more expensive and reaching Crimea is significantly more difficult. Even with the railway bridge and the road bridge, which can be used to get to Crimea, there are substantial transportation problems. The second thing is that in recent months and since the middle of 2022, the media is increasingly reporting about drone attacks on chiefly military infrastructure in the Crimean Peninsula. This leads to concern among Russians and a reluctance to travel there due to security concerns. The outcome was that in 2020, the number of tourists fell by a third compared to the previous year. It was a pandemic year, but still not the peak of travel. And this year, before the holiday season, those working in the tourist industry are complaining that 70% of their occupancy has not yet been booked. We don't know yet how many Russians will travel to the peninsula, but they are already experiencing real problems and a serious economic blow to the entire region because tourism was the foundation of that region. Crimea does not have great significance for Russia in the current battles in Ukraine. Its significance from the point of view of the current war in Ukraine is small and strictly auxiliary. I'm even tempted to say that for Russians, the military presence in Belarus is more important than Crimea during the current aggression in Ukraine. Belarus has a much broader scope for action. Many more places in Ukraine can be affected by different kinds of weapons. But from this point of view, Crimea is much more limited even with regard to launching an attack from Crimea. I'd ask another question. What situation would Russia be in if it had had to launch the attack against Ukraine from Crimea itself? The answer is a land attack. Even with air support, naval support, Crimea is not an appealing place to develop an offensive onto the continental part of Ukraine. And we need to remember that Crimea is still Ukrainian territory, but occupied. In short, Ukraine could provide a repeat of Thermopylae. If the entire Russian force and the entire Ukrainian force met with the Russians wanting to break through and extend to the northeast and northwest, because it's not like it was for a few centuries, only the Isthmus of Perekop. There are two routes now. But they are rail lines which can easily be destroyed and cut off. They are quite narrow strips of land and parts not entirely made of land. It's very easy for a marching army to get bogged down there. There's simply not enough room. Russia values Crimea itself. It's not important in terms of controlling Ukraine or launching an offensive against Ukraine. Crimea is important, as it's always been important, in order to control the situation on the Black Sea. For Russians, possession of Crimea equates to their dominance of the waters of the Black Sea, including the entrance and exit of the Black Sea through the Turkish Straits. It's not that Crimea is needed for the war in Ukraine. The Russians need the war in Ukraine in order to use the advantages of Crimea to the maximum extent. To use those advantages as a bastion allowing Russia to control the situation in the Black Sea. This is why the Russians need the land link they created in spring 2022 and which they are maintaining. Part of the Kherson Oblast, Zaporizhia Oblast and the Donetsk Oblast. The most important factor for Russia to use Crimea is whether they have the land link. Of course, in peacetime, the Kerch Strait, the Kerch Bridge, was enough for Russia. But in wartime, we've seen that this is all very fragile. All these links are fragile. Only one thing provides Russia with a guarantee of securing Crimea if they were considering a larger war, not just the conquest of Ukraine or a part of it. They would need this strip of land, which secures the land link to Crimea. Ukraine's potential recapture of Crimea will depend on both the political and the military factors. Na zachodzie nie ma zgodności co do In the West, there is no disagreement that Russia has to leave Ukraine, that Ukraine has to recapture its lost territory, but there is no consensus whether that should include Crimea. This is for various reasons. In the West, they are aware of how Russia sees Crimea, that it's a sensitive and important point. They consider it to be their own territory. There is the general belief in the United States and Western Europe that any attempt at recapturing Crimea will be seen by Russia as the de facto justification of the use of nuclear arms. That is the political element. The military situation will be of equal importance. Ukraine would first need to cut Crimea off by a successful counterattack.
then they'd be faced with the problem of attacking the peninsula itself. The defensive lines in the direction of Crimea are the most developed since the Second World War. They're really deep. Depending on the direction, in the Donetsk region there are two big lines of defense with different layers. In the Zaporizhia region and partly the Kherson region there are three lines of defense. After the destruction of the Novokhovka hydropower plant, the situation changed slightly because the defenses were largely flooded in the Russian-controlled territory. One of these lines of defense in the Kherson region has been de facto washed away. At the moment, it's a strip of no man's land up to 20 kilometers long. Russia's defensive conditions have worsened significantly. We don't need to list what else they lost. They had prepared weapon supplies which they weren't able to evacuate because they ran out of time. It's harder there, but they still have the defensive position lines which are organized in practically the same manner as on the Crimean Peninsula. What's more, satellite imagery shows that Russians are building fortifications on the peninsula itself. So any actions undertaken by the Ukrainian army will require great commitment and many casualties. And above all, many, many more heavy weapons and ammunition from the West. Above all, ammunition for the artillery and increased artillery support in order to destroy the fortified Russian positions. Because they won't be destroyed by tanks or infantry fighting vehicles or by an attacking infantry. They must be destroyed either by planes or by heavy artillery. The Ukrainians do not have enough of these to meet their needs. Thank you for watching this OSW documentary. If you enjoyed it, please like it and subscribe to our channel.